Thanks for coming out. I wasn't sure what to expect in terms of the turnout because this is a podcasting conference and there are a lot of podcasting uh, sessions going on this weekend, which is a, a big change. Uh, can I see it? just a show of hands for how many folks have been here before in podcast in the past? Yeah, so uh, like you, I've been coming out for a number of years and it's funny to see how PodCamp Toronto went from being all about podcasting to not at all about podcasting, and now we're back. It's funny how things just kind of go on a cycle, and that's a recurring theme for what we're going to be talking about uh, for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So hi, I'm Andy. Uh, I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at GoDaddy and mailing list for domain names, uh, but we do a lot more. And my job there, I look after content and community for GoDaddy Pro, which is our partner program for web designers and developers. But my work in the online community began quite a ways back. Uh, it all started off as a hobby for me back when I was a kid. I kept it up through college, working on fan sites and forums, uh, and then joining uh, GoDaddy in 2015 to serve as the community manager for GoDaddy Pro, which gave me the opportunity to start doing this full time. And something that I've noticed over the last couple of years is that where we started 10, 15 years ago with community, we started to drift away from this notion of online communities being disparate places and groups of people to going all in on social media. Now we're starting to see a shift back as folks are trying to move more towards alternative platforms and getting away from going all in on social. So the next uh, bunch of slides are condensing about 10 years worth of experience and thoughts and knowledge into just a big look at how we got here, where we're going next, and how we can jump on that, whether we are creatives, podcasters, if we're business owners, if we are activists, what can we do to leverage online community? If you want to follow along on uh, Twitter and share anything um, that I'm talking about, feel free to give, just give me a shout, and it's uh, at AndyMC on Twitter, and pretty much everywhere else. So first things first, uh, what is a community? Something that I've noticed when I have these conversations internally at GoDaddy, especially when I'm talking with uh, executives or other managers, is this notion that community is a particular place or a platform. But community is not just that. Community isn't a single place or a platform. A community is the people. It's the people that make up the community. And that community can uh, congregate around the different places and platforms. When we look at the podcasting community in Toronto, we have PodCamp Toronto, which is a great single event, and we all congregate around this. But then there are other meetups and events and things that take place online and offline where that same community comes together. And that's what community is all about. It's all about those people who are connected to each other around something they have in common. Now, communities can form around many different things. When we think about community historically, it's often about a place. Uh, the city of Toronto being a community, Ontario being a community, your local neighborhood being a community. But we also have uh, communities of purpose. We are all working together to achieve something, to make something happen. Or it might be a community of profession. Like I, I'm a marketer, but I'm also a web developer, but I'm trying to get a foot into podcasting. These are all different professions, and they all have their own communities. People who are brought together by this common point. And then there are communities of interest. Podcasting itself, if you're not interested in that as a profession, you're doing it as a hobby, that is an interest. Me growing up, video games were a huge interest. I loved gaming, that was my thing from high school through college. WordPress, another massive interest of mine, is why I helped organize WordPress meetups for over 10 years. Now when we jump into a community at first, we don't fit in right away. There's this sense that when we show up in a room and we don't know anybody, we kind of feel like outsiders. And we don't really feel like we belong quite yet. We kind of feel like interlopers. And until we feel this sense of belonging within the community, we don't really feel like we're a member of that community. And that sense of belonging grows over time through shared experiences. So right now, uh, with everyone in this room, uh, how many, show of hands, how many folks here know someone else in this room right now? We have a few. For everybody else, it's your first time coming together in the same space with other people. But if you show up at another session, and you see the same face, 
or you go grab lunch at the same place, this famili uh, familiarity that starts to emerge, and you start to feel a little bit more comfortable. You've seen this person before, maybe you strike up a conversation, start to know them a little bit better. That sense of belonging, and that sense of connectedness with each other that grows, that's what community is all about. That connection with each other. Online, we have this 1% rule of participation. And you may have seen this mentioned before. Uh, we talk about it a lot uh, for online forums and online communities, where the vast majority of participation is driven by a small handful of individuals. When we look at PodCamp, we have a small group of speakers like myself, but we have many, many more people who are coming out to attend and connect and learn from each other. The way we break it down for online community is we look at it as 90% of the people who show up in an online community are lurkers who are observing. They look at a website like Reddit, massive, massively popular website. The vast, vast majority of traffic that hits that website, just lurking. I'm one of them. I'm active on Reddit, but I never post anything on Reddit. But I'm on there every day, just reading comments, skimming through threads about a bunch of different topics. I don't consider myself an active member, but I do consider myself a member because I know that I have this common point of reference with other people who may also see themselves as Redditors or Reddit users. The next step up from that, 9% somewhat active, you might jump in and drop a comment on a thread every once in a while. Maybe you'll participate now and again, but not very often. And then there's that 1%, 1% of all the people in the community will be the ones driving the vast majority of the activity. So, using PodCamp Toronto as an example again, the organizers, the volunteers, this 1% of the overall membership, those are the folks who are making sure that things move forward and make things happen. There's this other principle that we talk about in business, this Pareto principle, aka the 80-20 uh, rule, where 80% of the effect, or 80% of the outcome, is going to be driven by 20% of the cause. And the problem is figuring out which 20% is making that 80% happen. So this disparity is common throughout our lives in many different aspects of what we do day to day. And so for community, what we're trying to figure out when we think about bringing people together uh, is identifying who are the people that are the most engaged and how can we help them come together and make things happen. Another trait for community, you need symbolism and language. This is online law fun. This is just about community in general. Unique symbolism, things that matter to each other, that matter to people in the community, that may not mean anything to people outside of the community. The little icons for PodCamp Toronto that you see on the stickers, the logo of PodCamp Toronto, those little badges that are on the site, these are all symbols that mean something to PodCamp Toronto, but for anybody else who's never seen them before, they see them and they wonder, what do those things mean? They carry meaning for people within the community. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sports teams, especially sports teams, logos, mascots, colors. I think that's one of the strongest examples of symbols that mean something. And language, same deal. Words that may mean nothing to somebody on the outside of the community may carry a lot of meaning and purpose and value to people within the community. In Toronto, we the North, language, something that unites fans initially of the Raptors, but then became to encompass I'd say, uh, Canada, in a way. Uh, the Canadian flag, the maple leaf. And when American companies come to Canada and they look for an easy way to show that, hey, we're Canadian too, they just look for a way to put a little maple leaf in there. And then raccoons. Uh, <laughs> raccoons and the, especially over the last five years, the amount of uh, almost emotional connection that we've seen to have to raccoons as a symbol of the city uh, is, Astounding. All of this boils down to this statement. This is who I am, this is who we are. When you start to feel like you identify with that community, that this is an extension of you, and you feel that sense of belonging within a broader group of people, that's what community is all about. So where are we now when it comes to community online? We go back to 2007 with the introduction of the iPhone. That was a pivotal point in our modern history, where Steve Jobs comes out and talks about having this technology in your pocket that combines music, communication, and the internet, the web, something that previously was spread across multiple devices 
And in the case of the internet, it was something that was on a computer that at best you had a laptop that you were carrying with you. But this idea of constant connectivity was not was not really known outside of the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry wasn't really uh, as pervasive as phones are today. Jump ahead a few years as the penetration of mobile devices. I mentioned the iPhone, like look at Android, just Android picking up where people didn't want an iPhone or couldn't afford an iPhone. We get to this point in the early 2010s where the mobile, the mobile web, uh, folks having a smartphone, just everywhere. And so we start to see the emergence of social media, something that was bound to the desktop and to the laptop. Our personal computers prior to that is now with us everywhere that we go. Now these platforms, and I'm going to reference them repeatedly, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, these platforms morphed over the years. What started off as something that was driven by, or an organic feed, started to be driven by algorithms. When we started going from reverse chronological of what your friends and family were posting to now what those platforms thought you should see, and then monetizing that attention through advertising, that's how everything works now. Doesn't matter what platform you're on. It's feeds of constant content driven by algorithms monetized through ads. In that time over the past 10 years, we also saw the introduction of likes and follows. This way to quantify the engagement online. Because what started off as supposedly a way to connect people around community started becoming more of a game. You were competing for points. How many likes could you get? How many followers could you get? And those became incentives. You wanted to keep going on. You wanted to keep sharing content. You wanted to keep putting more stuff into the feed because it was no longer about connecting. It was about filling the system. And on the business side, what was first talked about as this fantastic way to connect with your customers, find new customers, if you're a small business, to find new customers online from around the world, organic, for free, a great way to reach new people, became increasingly pay to play. Because that's what the business model is all about for modern social media. It's about owning the attention, selling ads, and making billions of dollars. What started off as a platform around community, making people more connected, became this fire hose of content where we're feeding into it, the algorithms decide what we see, we try to game the algorithms to make sure our stuff is seen the most, and at the end of the day, if we're a business, we're going to buy ads because we need the attention coming from those feeds, because that's where all the attention is. Same case for politicians running campaigns. We're going to where the attention is. And a little aside here, I think it's funny that we talk about it as the feed. The feed, the feed, the feed, the feed. We constantly need to go to the feed. We need to go to the feed because that's where everything is. The attention is all about the feed. And it's this tragedy of the commons, this tragedy of the social media commons that brought us here. So the tragedy of the commons, if you haven't heard of this term before, I'll just read out the description from Wikipedia. The tragedy of the commons is a situation in a shared resource system where individual users acting independently according to their own self-interest behave contrary to the common good of all users by depleting or spoiling the shared resource through their collective action. So as we moved from the open web to centralized platforms, as attention started to consolidate around these central places, we started to spoil our attention. We started to spoil our shared resource. Because now we were feeding into this ecosystem of the feed and content and playing to the algorithms and fueling that growing ad industry and ended up making those companies the biggest in the world. Another interesting thought too is if you think back to the 90s when everyone started getting online, we were so sensitive about the amount of data that we would share. I remember when we got our first personal computer in the late 90s, uh, my mom being, and she still largely is, really adamant that you never share anything online. She didn't get on Facebook until two years ago. She was terrified of putting any information out on the web. She still doesn't buy things online because of this notion of putting your credit card in a form on a web page just seems so scary. I like to think of my mom as uh, almost as a symbol of maybe not where we get back to, but getting back 
to that direction. Because where she's at, to me, is where we were in the early to mid 2000s, where we were comfortable on the web, but we were still cautious. We didn't trust everything that came uh, up in our browsers because we didn't know. We didn't know where it came from. And right now, increasingly, it's coming from a small set of companies. When we look at social media, Facebook, the blue app, Messenger, WhatsApp, Instagram, one company controls all of that attention. And when we think about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, regardless of the scope or scale or impact of that, I think it was a great example of unintended consequences. Where they were piggybacking on a platform that was open to developers <coughs> because Facebook was looking for more ways to bring people into the system and keep attention on the system, that was their priority. Other things that have spun out out of this consolidated atten uh, attention and everything pouring into central places. Fun pastimes like doxing. Uh, who here knows what doxing is? Okay, so for everybody else, doxing is when you disclose personal information of the target. If you're a troll, if you're a, a jerk, <laughs> and you want to get someone, uh, get someone good, you take their personal contact information and you put it online and you just rally the trolls and get them to go after that person. So it could be doxing you, it could be doxing your family. It's about taking that personal information that we know not to share online and sharing it. Celebrities, politicians, journalists, people who have triggered some group are often at the receiving end of this. Mm -hmm. Women, thank you. If you look up Gamergate, one of the most... If you look up Gamergate, that's a, a strong example of how far certain groups will go around Dawson. Um, swatting is another one, which, uh, show of hands again, and people who know what swatting is. Okay, so swatting, so imagine instead of just releasing personal information, you decide, no, we're not gonna release personal information. Instead, I'm gonna call the police, and I'm gonna say that someone's being held hostage, or someone has a bomb, or there's a drug deal going down. Basically, you're gonna take the resources of law enforcement and send that SWAT team swooping in on your target. On a less extreme level, but much more pervasive, bullying and harassment. Especially when we look at youth and this. When I think about like my nieces and nephews, growing up right now, preteens, the fact that this is always with them. They can't escape the bullying and harassment. And then with that comes the depression and the mental health issues. And if you've been following the news, just the growth, the explosive growth of people suffering from mental health issues and, and depression coming out of all of that. And then on the platform side, these platforms outsourcing content moderation to third parties, where it's essentially like a, uh, think of like a call center, but instead of um, working phones, they're just moderating content that flies through these platforms, and then the stuff that they see, the, the worst possible stuff that comes through these platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, they're moderating this, and they're getting PTSD from it, because they are seeing stuff, they're seeing things that nobody should have to witness. So all of this, all of this baggage and damage, things that used to possibly be isolated, uh, that you could walk away from. And I'm thinking particularly about bullying and harassment for kids. Home was a safe space. Like you knew if you were bullied, you could go home and you'd be relatively safe. You had a safe home. You can't escape that now. Because social media is gonna follow you and you're gonna be harassed by your classmates, by their kids in school, by other people, strangers on the internet, no matter where you are. But because the social web is so pervasive, especially for kids growing up right now, if you're not on there, you're nobody, but if you are on there, you're an easy target. There's no safe space, no place to get away from. Which is a really long way of saying that social media is in the community. And it's really frustrated me uh, as someone who um, was really active in online communities early on, looking at how social media, um, these platforms tell themselves as community, and they talk about community being very important, but there's little to no aspect of how they were built and how they evolved that suggest that they were built for community. They were built for attention. <coughs> That's all we had. 
So how did we get here? I'm going to go way back. 1970s. Early, early days of the online community space. Bulletin board systems back in the 1970s were down to the geographic region. So you can think of uh, Toronto and the GTA would have a VDS that was limited to people within the region because you had to dial in and connect to this bulletin board system. The bulletin board system was a message board. You would post discussions, start topics, uh, very similar to what you would see on any online message board today, but it was down to the geographic region. In the 1980s, Usenet came along. Usenet was similar to a BBS in that you had to dial in with its own separate protocol. But there were all these different Usenet groups around topics. So what started off as an online community around a geographic region became online communities around topics. Lots and lots of different topics, different categories. In the late 1980s, we got IRC, Internet Relay Chat. IRC, think of it as uh, instant messenger, um, online chat rooms for everybody. Uh, and so this was like Usenet, you would have different IRC servers and different IRC channels for different topics, different areas of interest. In the 1990s, when the web came about, we got discussion forums, similar to BBS's, similar to Usenet, except now, instead of them being on their own separate protocols where you had to use separate clients to connect to them, you could just fire up your browser. You could fire up Netscape or Internet Explorer and jump in to these online discussion forums hosted on the web. Then in the 2000s, we started to see blogs come online. Blogging was a big deal because now we were seeing individuals gain a voice <coughs> that rivaled traditional media. We saw, especially uh, towards 2004, 2005, something like 2005, where individual bloggers, because they were able to move so quickly, they were able to break news before traditional media outlets. And this whole notion of the blogosphere and the power of blogs around that time was really at its peak. And what came out of blogging and that whole world was Web 2.0 in the late 2000s. And Web 2.0 took the web in what was historically one way where you could post things on the web if you were tech savvy enough to start up a blog, you could have your own website and post up Web 2.0 and the technology that emerged around that this is when we started to see social networks take off because now it was becoming easier for anybody to jump on and create their own web presence without having to know uh, any of the technical stuff. You could jump onto MySpace, you could jump onto Friendster and start having a presence without all of the other stuff that was involved. The social networks evolved into social media thanks to the iPhone, thanks to these mobile devices that made sure we were always connected no matter where we were we could be online. As those mobile devices evolved, we started getting stronger cameras, we could start uh, posting more and doing more because the bandwidth improved, right? We could post more content, uh, consume more content. The volume of the content that went out increased dramatically. That led to the algorithms, because how do you sort through all of these different chunks of content that are coming through you basically have a choice. Do we start breaking things up and directing people to different places where they find the things that they're interested in? Well, that's not good for business. If your business is controlling attention and consolidating it all to one spot instead, what do we do? We build an algorithm for it. And we'll let the algorithm decide for you what you should see. Hence, what we see with Facebook, what we see with Twitter, what we see with Instagram, what we see with YouTube. And it doesn't take long to go down a really dark rabbit hole on YouTube to yeah. recommended videos. <laughs> it's out of control. Bottom line, it's out of control. And it's out of control to the point now that Facebook is asking to be regulated. They don't want to do it themselves, though, because if they were to do it for themselves, that'd be bad for business. They don't want to make a decision. They want the decision to be made for them so they can then say, hey, we're not responsible here. So this uh, came out of a news article from a couple weeks back. Quote, uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg said on Saturday that social media companies need more guidance and regulation from governments in order to tackle the growing problem of harmful content online, or harmful online content. So this uh, quote from CNBC. They're asking for this. They know that it's spiraled beyond their control. They built it this way. The platforms were built to pull everything in and let everyone 
publish as much as possible. It's not a community platform. So, what can we learn from the past? If we go back to BBSs, we go back to Usenet, IRC, go back in time, what can we learn from those communities? Well, there are three types of guidelines that we would always look at as folks who were running IRC servers, or running discussion forums, and they were these. The first one are the community guidelines. Every online community has set of rules, policies, that members had to follow. And whenever you join a new community, you'd be pointed to these rules. The second one were the moderation guidelines. So how do we enforce the rules? How do the volunteer moderators or paid staff of this community enforce the rules that we set? And then third was governance. Governance being how do we make decisions? So as a community group, as leaders, as organizers, how do we make decisions on what we do in the community? And all community organizations need these guidelines, they need these policies. But they were an afterthought for big social media. We've just started to see the conversations around code of conduct and guidelines and governance. Now that we're <laughs> past the tipping point. But these are things that, when I think back to when I was heavy on uh, message board and online forums, early 2000s, our rules were set. We had clear moderation policies on how we enforced those rules. All of these things were already in place. This is not new. If you were to go back and look at BBSs or Usenet groups from the 70s and the 80s, they all had rules because this is how you kept things in check. You didn't figure it out after the fact. How do we deal with all of this terrible content? Let's prevent the terrible content from happening in the first place by putting in the rules and enforcing the rules from the outset, setting the expectations. And it wasn't perfect. You know, things were never perfect for online communities, but we had options because things weren't all consolidated into central platforms. If we had that group, they were easier, easier to isolate. So if you had, for example, a really bad online community, a really bad forum that was full of really bad stuff, you could go to an internet service provider. You could go to Google and get Google to blacklist those sites from the search results. Or you could go to the web host that's hosting that platform and say that this site has terrible malicious content, you should take it down. Because the groups were smaller, they weren't all in on central platforms, it was much easier because they were smaller, they were easier to deal with. And it was easier for ISPs to say, hey, this is a really harmful community, a harmful website posting stuff that we, as a service provider, do not want to support. So, we're going to push them off our platform. But social networks, the big social media companies don't want to do that because it rocks the boat. It's bad for business. If you want to own as much attention as possible because that's what your bottom line is built around, you want it to be a really, really, really big tent. And you don't want to be the one saying, hey, your stuff is against our guidelines. In the US, being able to shield themselves under freedom of speech. And it's a really easy way to do that. Well, we're not going to do anything about this group because that'd be censorship. So we're just gonna let them be as they are and uh, in the process, we're not gonna worry about it, we're just gonna keep selling ads. We can do a lot better. <laughs> we can do a lot better. We've been here before. And that brings us to the pendulum of swinging back. So what I'm seeing uh, recently, over the last couple of years, is making me really nostalgic for where we on platforms that aren't Facebook, that aren't Twitter, aren't Instagram. Rising up in other places, uh, it gives me some hope that we can not go back completely, but we can end up in a better place. And the social media companies are seeing this happen. They know the writing is on the wall. That's why when we look at, let's say, Facebook, a couple of years back, they really started investing in Facebook groups. Facebook groups were an afterthought for Facebook for a very long time. They didn't really care about groups. But then a couple of years ago, suddenly, from on high, the investment was really big on Facebook groups. At first, I was excited because I knew that Facebook groups were a big opportunity for connecting with other people around shared interests, for creating these communities. Uh, but then I realized, you know, Facebook groups are a really easy way for Facebook to say, you know what, we're going to offload the moderation and we're going to offload the responsibility to these groups so that if groups have the attention, well, they're still on our platform, so we can still 
monetize that, which is allowed to against that. They're still on our network. We still own the data. But enforcement of rules are down at the community group level. So we can put it on those volunteer moderators to take care of those groups. Now, I don't know if you've seen the stories that have started to circulate around <laughs> local Facebook group uh, managers stressing out because of the amount of crap that they have to handle. But all that's happened is the burden has shifted onto these users who want to step in and start managing these communities, but now they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because they don't have the level of control that they need to effectively run a group, effectively run along a community. But because that's where all the attention is, that's where it makes the most sense to be present as a group manager or, or group administrator on Facebook. Twitter is starting to go in this direction as well now that they're starting to uh, amp up Twitter topics. So you have the ability on Twitter now to dive into curated topics, curated categories, and Twitter's putting more emphasis around that. Twitter is also talking now, or at least um, see, uh, the CEO is talking about this idea that you could have a decentralized Twitter. Many different Twitters all connected to each other, which to me sounds a lot like hey, what if we offload the burden of managing this to these separate networks? But I would bet that under the hood, everything is going to be running through the same ad platform. They still want to control attention. They're just trying to figure out how do we offload the burden of dealing with moderation and dealing with content. Now, also on the rise, Slack, Discord, Substack. How many folks here use Slack? All right, how many folks here use Slack for groups that are not, that aren't where you work? A few? Discord, how many people here are familiar with Discord? How many people here are using Discord just to connect with other people? My nieces and nephews are all on Discord. Somehow, Discord became the platform, the social network platform for their school. My wife just told me that she had to go and download Discord and put it on her phone and figure out how to use it because it's the only way that she can talk with her niece. <laughs> Something that I'm seeing in the community management space, a bunch of private Slack teams spinning up for different industries. Some of them free, some of them premium, building it up on top of email. But Substack is taking this idea of newsletters and kind of flipping it, where it's now, imagine if you were blogging through email, and making it an email first focus versus a browser first. Email is pervasive, everybody has an email. Yeah. Um, can you just find out where Reddit fits into all of this? Reddit's really interesting. Reddit is like a hybrid where it's a central platform, but it operates very much like an old school message board. The way everything is set up, and each subreddit has its own team of moderators and, and staff uh, who set the rules and enforce the rules and take care of all that. I think Reddit's interesting because they have they are somehow balancing the uh, community focus, which is very community oriented, while at the same time trying to expand as a social platform without going all in with the share all the data, everything is algorithm driven. It's an interesting balancing act. And I think that's why Reddit continues to rise in traffic and maintains a kind of safe space because you can be completely anonymous and use Reddit. You can share no information, you can use a pseudonym. It's very much a web forum. Just now it's the biggest web forum. So, another opportunity, uh, opportunity that I'm seeing um, pick up uh, is the membership sites as a service. So, there's a uh, service out there called Mighty Networks. And Mighty Networks, uh, it's mightynetworks.com. It's a platform that allows you to go in and build a website, but build a website around a community. So if you are a course creator or a podcaster and you have an audience and you want a site, but a site that is built community first rather than content first, Mighty Networks is a really good example of that. Mighty Networks is just one platform. There are so many other platforms that, that are spinning up and me coming from the WordPress world, uh, WordPress being used as a platform for building membership sites where uh, you can create this community presence, an independent community presence around a site that you run on your own. We're seeing that pick up. 
I also see that we are uh, due for a resurgence of old school forum software. So I'm seeing for the first time in a long time people talking about uh, things like vBulletin and PHP, VB, uh, Envision Power Board, like all these different, and vanilla out of Montreal, uh, all of the <coughs> forum software uh, that have been around for a long time. Like these, a lot of these companies started off in the early 2000s. The attention kind of waned for a while, especially around social media, but now as people start thinking about community more and more and pulling out of these social media platforms, this is an opportunity for these forum uh, platforms to pick back up again, where they can be isolated, independent online communities. And what does that mean for us as people? So the platforms and tech aside, for us as individuals, as community members, whether it be members of local communities or communities of interest and purpose, all of this is a good thing. As more independent online communities pick up, it's an opportunity for us to choose where and what we want to share. We don't need to <laughs> divest, uh, divulge, divulge all our information to a few companies. We can share as much as we want to within the communities that we belong to. We can show up as we want to. So if we don't want to disclose our actual identity, if we want to operate under a pseudonym or an alias, we can do that. Who you are as a podcaster would be completely different from who you are as a career professional, from who you are as a member of a neighborhood association. When you're on Facebook, all of those worlds collide, and it gets really messy. I'm sure we've all seen it. <laughs> so being able to choose where you're going to show up and how you show up is a huge opportunity. And kids are already doing it. And who here has heard of the term Finsta? Okay, this is fun. Finsta uh, is really prevalent mostly around uh, teens, where they're spinning up fake Instagram accounts, and they're using those accounts to follow things that they're interested in, but they don't want people to know that they're interested in. There's concern, I know, when I was doing research on this, I was looking at uh, parenting blogs, and parents are freaking out because it's like, oh, my kid has a social media presence that I don't know about. What are they looking at? Chances are it's no worse than what they'd be looking at under the profile that you actually know about. What this allows, though, is that they can go and be their own person, pursue their own interests without worrying about their actual identity, their actual person being disclosed. And when you're just figuring out who you are as an individual, like I am terrified of the thought of folks going back in time and finding stuff that I was posting when I was 15 or 16. I found some of that stuff and it is the cringiest, most embarrassing content, but it was all done under an alias and I hope that no one makes a connection. So the kids are doing the same thing. And I think it's great. I think it's great that you can figure out who you are as an individual safely without tying it back to the person you are going to be for the rest of your life. And I think that was one of the, the biggest opportunities of the web, especially early on, when that was assumed to be the way you operated, that you never disclosed who you actually were. Who you were online was different from who you were offline. And it was such a big moment if you ever actually met anybody that you knew online, offline. Making that jump from online to offline was a huge moment. Or, God, if you actually shared a photo of yourself or jumped on a, a webcam conversation, that was a huge deal. But now we just open ourselves up first. We, <laughs> we share everything first, share all of our moments, our entire personal story first, rather than building up to that. Okay, back to, back to this. <laughs> uh, there are more opportunities for nonprofits and activists. I think there's a really big opportunity for uh, organizations to leverage the social media technology, like this idea of bringing groups together, using the web, using the tech, without bringing the companies with them. So being able to have a social network like Facebook, but one that is specific to the organization that you belong to, so the only people that have access to that information are the people in the organization. Facebook, in terms of a concept of connecting a bunch of people together and sharing information and everything else, I think that's great. We, there's value there. But all of that globally being with one company, not a huge fan of that. And there's more opportunities for creators. This is a big one for folks in this room who are interested in uh, diving into podcasting or if you're an artist or if you're a creator right now. Think about transforming your audience into a community. So in the same way that we're all here and we can all connect with each other, what I will uh, implore you to do 
after this, uh, when you go for lunch, grab a couple other people, make a connection, go for lunch as a group, get to know other people in the room. So it's not just like you staring at whoever, whoever is at the front of the room, you get to know the other people in the room. So there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of experiences, a lot of interesting stories in here right now. And then for businesses, this is where I spend a lot of my time, because uh, I work at GoDaddy, and content and community is my full-time gig. I'm really, really interested in this piece. Uh, and this applies to businesses of all sizes. Uh, there's an opportunity for us to show up as uh, businesses and participate in existing communities. So showing up at events like this and participating as a brand. I'm just here as myself, because I've been coming to Camp Toronto for a long time, uh, well before I ever forgot about it. Uh, but showing up at events and supporting local events as a business is a huge opportunity to do more there. Uh, leading communities, starting uh, communities of purpose or interest as a brand or as a company, thinking about not just your customers, but why does your business exist? What is the thing that you are obsessive about? If Hindenburg did a, uh, a regular meetup group for podcasters, I think that would be an amazing opportunity for them. You care about podcasting, you care about journalism, you care about these things. What community could you start what community group could you start that brings people together around this topic? You're there as a leader, as a brand, but it's not about your product or your technology. It's about you being there as a facilitator. And the third, investing in customers. Treating customers less as a, as a uh, just this collective people of chaos, or as this uh, resource that we need to service and support, and more as this community of people that we can connect to each other, we connect the customers to each other, but then also helping them succeed in whatever way we can that is above and beyond just the products and services that we sell. I spend most of my time thinking about this. <laughs> uh, and then last but not least, um, more opportunity, opportunity for community managers. So the profession of community management has for a long time been anchored in customer support and social media management. When you think about the, the role of community manager, these things come to mind first. What we can now see are more opportunities to expand beyond that, where we can look at marketing, we can look at growth, we can look at product, we can look at services, we can look at all of these other aspects of a business, or aspects of an organization, of a nonprofit, that all tie back to community, that community management would be a really in demand uh, role to support all of these things. And it's not just customer support and social media. So on the revenue side, how do you make an online community sustain itself? There needs to be some sort of revenue component. What I've seen uh, work, the premium access, the selling membership, if you look at um, how newsrooms are increasingly supporting themselves, how journalism is supporting itself, uh, premium access to content, premium access to the journalists and to the organization, um, I was just reading about how the New York Times, I think it's the New York Times, the New York Times or courts have started doing these uh, participatory conference calls where they invite subscribers to join them on a call. It's essentially like a meetup over audio and you can talk to the journalists about the topics that they are covering. And I, I think that's like a really interesting um, way to expand in the community while staying anchored on the mission of journalism and premium access to content. We see creators doing this quite a bit. We look at Patreon and how creators will make exclusive content available to supporters through Patreon. Uh, same idea. Um, experiences, so on, online and offline experiences, bringing people out to retreats, doing conferences and summits, meetups, uh, affiliate commissions, um, Wirecutter from New York Times. Great reviews of products. If you buy a product through Wirecutter, they get an affiliate kickback. So that's another opportunity where if you can uh, refer your community members to make a purchase or sign up for something or whatever, getting some sort of finder fee or commission, some kickback off of that. And last but not least, sponsorships. Not advertising per se, but sponsorships. And the reason I wanted to clarify the difference between those two is that advertising is highly transactional, whereas you're gonna buy a slot in a space on a website. Sponsorship is more about alignment and having a closer relationship between the sponsor and the community group. So if you're looking for sponsors for a community group that you run, online or offline, 
look for sponsors that are aligned to the, to the mission of your group, that are aligned to the things that your group, are, uh, your group is about, and figure out ways to not just have this financial transaction, but actually collaborate. Are there things that you can do together tied around that sponsorship that can help you succeed? So, as we come to the end here, next steps, plan for success from the start. So, uh, legacy social media was all about anything goes. Wide open, big, big tent, bring all the attention in. As we go forward with community groups, especially in clear purpose, having clear rules. So create your community guidelines, create that code of conduct, the rules that your group members need to follow. One that I'm uh, really big on for groups is no religion, no politics. I find that if you bring people together around a topic or interest, I will see questions. Just a moment, got three more slides. Uh, <laughs> no religion, no politics. The reason for this is that these are very divisive at the beginning. If you can get people coming together around things that they share, things that they have mutual interest, interest around first, make that the anchor. If they want to go and have a conversation about religion or politics elsewhere, have a little side conversation, direct message online, that's fine. Your responsibility as a community organizer is to bring these people together. Now, if your community organization is tied to religion or politics, different story. <laughs> but for general interest, profession, um, hobbies, things like that, I try very hard to make this one of the ground rules because it is so divisive and it can just start things off on a really bad foot at the beginning. Uh, number two, create your moderation guidelines. So decide how the rules are going to be enforced. One thing I really like is to have a record of every corrective action. This is a lot easier online than offline. Online, um, depending on the community platform that you're using, the ability to record corrective actions alongside a community member's profile is really, really useful for other moderators or other volunteers to reference. So if someone keeps pushing the envelope by just towing the line, uh, you may want to give them a more severe um, corrective action than someone who slipped up once or twice. Having that context is really important, so you're not just, uh, the, the guidelines aren't hard and fast, you're giving uh, empowerment to moderators and volunteers to make decisions based on the context. And third, uh, create your governance model, so from the beginning decide how are you going to make choices as a group. Uh, I'm working with uh, a buddy of mine out in Whitby, and we're starting up a new uh, community group for local businesses. One of the first discussions we had was, how are we going to make decisions as a group? Like, is it going to come to us as the founders of this organization? Are we going to delegate it out to the community? Do we have open voting? Like, what's, how do we do this? That the model we settled on might change, but the fact that we had this conversation early on means that we know what we're going to do when we need to make decisions. And having that documented and down on paper is much more powerful than just having a verbal agreement to, to say, yeah, we'll just figure it out as we need to. So, closing statement. Let's take back the web. We started with disparate online communities, initially based on location and then into interest and, and uh, subjects. And then over the years, we consolidated all of our attention on all of our data and everything else into a handful of companies. We need to swing back. We need to get that pendulum to swing back. And we have the technology, we have the means to make it happen, but there needs to be a push for it from folks who are in a position to start these new communities. So I'll leave you with a quote from Mark Zuckerberg. Our digital social environments will feel very different over the next five years, re-emphasizing private interaction helping us build the smaller communities we all need in our lives. I agree 100%.